the image tag. Um, I'm going to give you my two cents on it, and part of it probably would probably be a review, and part of it may be new stuff or at least stuff considered from uh, a slightly different angle. Um, images on, on web pages really um, can be put there for, for two purposes, and um, one of them is that they can serve to be content of the page. You know, if for example a, a new automobiles coming out, you know, uh, a, a, a brand new model of automobile com, c comes out. A picture of that automobile on the page actually serves as content. And it tells you, you know, they, as the old saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. The, the picture tells you some information about the automobile that would either be impossible or difficult to get just from words. All right. Um, if I was going to explain to you how to assemble something, you know, furniture from Ikea, all right? Um, the picture is one thing, or, or I'm sorry, through words, um, I wouldn't be able to necessarily do it, but the picture would allow me to go in and uh, actually do a better job by, by actually showing you instead of just uh, describing it to you for words. So sometimes the pictures are actually part of the content of the page, and in many cases they are. The other time, they serve simply as decoration. They serve as uh, design elements, whereas maybe they set the mood for the page. Um, they may serve as sort of a branding. In other words, uh, a page, uh, an organization may have their logo on a page. That helps you associate the page and the content with their organization. And uh, you could even use images to set aside content uh, on your page. So really, images serve sort of two purposes. Um, these days, the, the connection speed to the internet is blazing compared to what it's been in the past. Uh, when, you know, um, you know when, when I first started doing web development, you know, image sizes were um, you know, keeping an eye on your image sizes were, were, was critical because if they were too big, your page would take forever to load. I will say though, however, is that it's always going to be an issue how big your images are. And it's going to be an image for a couple of reasons. First of all, yeah, at some point the speed's going to be so fast that that probably won't matter. That's true. But Depending on the kind of connection that people have these days, it's still possible that people are running slower connections. And you don't want to simply bog down their pages just because many people do have very fast connections. The other issue as well is there's the issue of clutter. You know, um, one or two well-chosen, well-placed images can have as much impact as ten just sort of haphazard images just thrown together on a page. All right. Remember that anything you put on your web page has a potential to distract people from everything else on your web page. All right, so if you have 10 images, you know, people might glance through them and may or may not notice what you want them to notice. If, however, you have a couple of, of carefully chosen images, people will notice those uh, a, a lot better. Um, because of that, we are going to uh, be at least somewhat aware of the size of the image and again the number of images that you, you put in. We're going to very briefly run through how you can resize an image. All right. Um, this isn't a, a class in Photoshop and this isn't a class in multimedia or anything like that. So I don't expect you to be experts in any of this stuff. But if you are going to work doing um, web stuff at all, you should at least have a, a general um, familiarity with how to, emit, uh, how to edit images. I have an image here, image of one of my cats, one of my former cats I should say. Former in the sense that he, he has passed away, not former in the sense that he's no longer a cat and now is something else, all right. Thought I had to make that clear, all right. If we right mouse on this and click properties, we can get some information about it. And this one is 52 kilobytes, which isn't a particularly big image. I think for your assignment, I was, uh, I even enforced a smaller limit though. I said 40 kilobytes. 
And um, the idea there was just to make you aware of it and uh, so that you can take a look at it and, and be aware of the size of the image and, and make it smaller. So if I look at this image, the image looks like this. And I can open it up any number of ways. All right, this is Microsoft's Office Picture Manager. And that's a view at 100%. All right. What if this is too big? What if I want a smaller copy of the image? Or what if I want a thumbnail of the image? Does anybody know what I mean by a thumbnail? Thumbnail is like a smaller version of the image that um, oftentimes you use like as a link. Like maybe there'll be a link to a page and, and rather than having the full image, you'll have a smaller version of it. Now here's a secret about thumbnails that, that not everyone uh, realizes is a thumbnail doesn't have to be just a smaller copy of the picture. You can actually take a portion of the picture whoops, and make it the thumbnail. So that's sometimes a very effective tool to use. We'll, we'll take a look at that um, um, going um, um, a, as, we, uh, as we continue uh, along our way here. Now there's all sorts of image editing programs, but um, if you are on Windows, the, the most basic fundamental image editing program that exists is called Paint. All right. Um, and, and so we'll do a little bit of simple editing in that. On the Mac side, if you double click on an image, you can open it up in preview. And actually, the, the Mac preview I like a lot. It does, it does a lot for just being a very simple, straightforward fo photo editing. And I like it a little better than paint. But, you know, paint gets the job done as well. I will suggest uh, 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 again that if you, when, when you start dealing with images, you do need to display the extensions of the files. Remember, a file's name consists of two parts: the the name of the image dot something, and it's important to know the 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 uh, extension of the file. And in this case, the extension is dot jpg. It's a JPEG file, but the extension is jpg. So again. Um, if you weren't aware of that, you could type in JPEG as the extension and then your image would not display. So let's right mouse on this and open it up in Paint. Whoops. And a newer version of Paint looks different than this, but it, it should have pretty much the same functionality. A couple things that you can do. One thing that you can do is you can crop the image. All right. Um, how do you crop the image? You can use this little triangle tool to select part of the image and cut it and then go in and say to make a new image and then paste in that image. And there you have a thumbnail uh, of it. All right. Another thing you can do is you can change the dimensions of the image. For example, if this is too big, let's say, and I want to make it smaller, I can go into stretch and skew, and I can go and maybe make it 60%. Now, in older versions of Paint especially, you could resize the... the um, height and width independently. So you have to be careful to change them by the same amount. If you don't change them by the same amount, let's say if I, if I resize the horizontal to be 60% and I resize the vertical to be 90%, the image looks distorted, looks stretched out, or it can either look stretched out horizontally or vertically. Um, that's one of my pet peeves with images. Um, that Whenever I see an image that is uh, not properly resized, and that, that's called the aspect ratio, the ratio between the height and width. Whenever I see the aspect ratio of an image distorted, where it's stretched out, or you know, either horizontally or vertically, that to me is is a uh, a sign of carelessness. Like uh, in an English class, if you forgot to put a period at the end of the sentence or something like that, it, it's a, it's a sign of amateurish. Uh, a web development and careless web development. And I, I really, uh, really uh, hold that against the page if I see it that way. So 
uh, I would suggest, you know, take the effort to, to resize it correctly. And if I resize it though, let's, let's go and do this right, and let's say I make it 80% and 80%, I can then go save it, and I'm going to save it as a copy. And you'll notice that the file size will have gone down. So if I look at this, it went from 52 to actually about 10 KB. So it's, it's a much smaller file. Um, one thing to be aware of, and I almost made the mistake, but I caught myself at the last second. Don't edit your original image. All right? Make a copy of your image and edit that. All right? The reason for that is you can always make an image smaller if you need to. So if an image is very big, you can always make it smaller if you need to. If you take an image, though, and make it smaller, you can never make it bigger again without distorting it. All right. Essentially, when you make an image smaller, you're getting rid of some of the information. All right. And when you get rid of the information, you can't get it back. And if you try to get it back, the program sort of guesses at it, and you'll get bad results. Let me try to do a very vivid demonstration of this on the second one. If I open this up in Paint, all right, if I were to go and make this very tiny, let's say I make it 5% of the original size. So we have a little bitty cat up there. We'll go and we'll save it. It's, it's 9 by 12 now. Wow. <laughs> if I go and open it up again, and I say, well, let me, boy, that was way too small. Let me make it bigger again. Let me make it uh, much bigger. So let's go and we'll make it 500% uh, of its size. And, gee, that's still too small. We'll make it 500 again. That's how, the, that's how the image became distorted. All right. Why? Because, again, you're losing information. When you make it smaller, you're losing the pixels. Uh, what's a pixel? A pixel is a dot on the screen. So when you compress it, you're getting rid of pixels. And making it smaller, you lose a little bit of detail, but it's not that big a deal. When you make it bigger, though, the program has no idea what pixels are there. And it ends up looking like this, which the name for an image that looks like this is pixelated. In other words, you can see the pixels. It isn't a nice, smooth thing. All right. So let's go and put a picture of my dearly departed cat on the web page. Now, this is going to be a bit of a stretch because the web pages that we were doing were about colleges. And my uh, cat really never attended college, all right? Uh, except he did, I suppose he attended, the, as they say, the school of hard knocks because he was, he was a stray and he was a rough stray and he had a little notch in his ear probably from little, little scrapes he got into when he was a little kitty. But at any rate, he never attended college. But we'll put him on the college page anyhow. What the heck? All right. There are two attributes for every image tag. The source attribute and the alt attribute. And let's spend a minute talking about them. An image tag simply says I have an image that I want to appear on my page. But it's much like a link tag. Well, which image do you want to show? You know, there's hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of images that could be. Which image do you want to show at this, in this particular web page? You need to specify the name of the file um, that, the, that the image is in. And in my case, again, it's simba.jpg. Now, notice I'm keeping everything in the same folder. So if I keep it all in the same folder, I, need, I only need to put in the name of the image. So I put in simba.jpg. I have to know the exact extension because, again, if I put in just simba, it wouldn't work. 
Or if I was mistaken and I thought this was a GIF file and I put in Simba.gif, it wouldn't work as well. All right, so I have to get the exact name of it right. The all attribute is used for a couple of reasons. The first reason is if for whatever reason the image doesn't display. Well, why might the image not display? The image might not display because there's some problem on the server end. Maybe the, uh, the image got deleted or moved around or something weird like that. All right. Number two, someone might be using a browser and they've turned images off. That's certainly not very common these days. It was more common back in the old days when, when internet connection speeds were very, very slow. But it is possible to turn off the images. So you don't see any images on a web page until you specifically ask for it. All right. So that's a couple circumstances in which it appears. Another critical reason that the alt attribute is used is for people that are accessing your web page via screen reading technology. All right? uh, in other words, people that are visually impaired. You know, how does a blind person surf the web? Well, there's software that reads the page to them. All right? Well, how can it read an image? Well, of course, it can't read an image. All right? But it can read an alt tag. I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of people say alt tag is actually the alt attribute of the, of the uh, image tag. So, what you do in the, in the alt attribute is you put in descriptive text. And it will display if for whatever reason the image got moved or, or deleted. And it will be read to people that are accessing your page via a screen reader. So, I could say a picture of Professor Zeller's cat who never attended college. So now if I go and view that, there you see his picture over there. Now, Let's simulate what would happen if something went wrong on the server. Let's go and delete this image for a second. You see, there is the alt text. And I can go and undo that. And it comes back. Now, I've talked about um, in many uh, in 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 the first few examples about putting everything in the same web. Uh, or I'm sorry, everything in the same folder, everything for the web page in the same folder. So all the pages, all the images, your CSS file, and so on. That can get a little cluttered. All right. So what you often do is just like you might do on your drive at home. You create a separate folder for your images. Uh, separate from the other files, like the, the, the web files. So, if I create a folder called images here, and then put in the image, so now it's not in the same folder, but it's in a folder called images, I'm no longer going to be able to see the image on the page. And I get the alt attribute. Until I go in and put the folder name in front of the file name. So if it's in a folder underneath your web page, you put the name of the folder slash the name of the image. If it's two folders, you put two folders. You know, if it was in images slash cat slash Simba, you'd just do the full path going down to it. All right. We'll probably talk about paths a little bit more later on, uh, but this is, this is fine for now. And now we're back able to see my good cat, Simba. All right.
questions about this. Now, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, how do you display, you had showed me in lab, how do you display the full name? The full name, yeah. You, you have to go in, and again, this, this will vary a little bit depending on the version of Windows you're on or what operating system you're on, but essentially, there is a folder options that you get to. I think in newer versions of Windows, there's a button over here that says Organize or a link over here that says Organize, but you'll get to this folder options. You then click for View, and you make sure that this option that says Hide Extensions for Known File Types is checked off, is not checked. Now, some pages use background images. Now, background images, what do I mean by background images? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a background image is simply an image that you have largely for decoration that you can put on your page. Now, this is something that can be done very well or it can be done very poorly. All right? We obviously want to do it well. I think in Angel I have an example of a very poor one. Let's go and take a look at it. in resources, a great example of bad web design. The world's worst website. Now, this is especially bad because not only is the background image bad, the background image is actually animated and bad. Now, this web page was done to demonstrate bad practices. Um, I don't think too many people create web pages like this much anymore. All right? People actually in the past did try to create web pages like this, and, and they were ugly and horrible, and everyone hated them. But this is a very extreme example, and an extreme example of a bad one. However, if tastefully done, background images can be done pretty effective. Let's, let's look here and see if I can find a good example of a background image. We'll come to yeah, this page. Notice how that image is just sort of in the background. You actually can see back behind it. It, it might be difficult to see, but the background over here, there's a little bit of texture to it, where it sort of looks like paper, looks like, like, uh, like a very textured sort of paper. Might be hard to see here. But that's an example of sort of a very subtle background image. There's actually a website that gives you some background patterns that you can use, and they say that if you want to, you can give them credit for it, but I don't even think they require that. Um, let's go and let's pick one for our page. Let's, let's pick this one. This one looks pretty subtle. It's, it, 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 again, it almost looks like a wallpaper sort of design. All right. So I'm going to right mouse on it. Or actually, I'll click on the download link. And it opens a zip file. So I'll open it. It gives me the file in the zip file. Now, we all know that if you have a zip file, you actually have to extract the file from the zip file in order to use it. So I will extract that file and put it in my folder with everything else.
And in fact, I'll put it in the images folder just to keep everything there. So now my images folder has this pattern in it and it has the cat picture. Now, how can I make that a background picture for my whole page? Well, this particular image isn't content on the page, right? It's just there for appearance or for decoration. Therefore, we're going to use CSS to do that. We're not going to use HTML. So what I can do is I can go into my CSS, open it up, and for background, I can say the background, it's not going to be a color. That's what the pound sign D, 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 D means. But it's going to be a URL. All right. What's a URL? It's a web address. Well, where is this file located? Well, it's underneath my CSS file in a folder called images. So I will say URL images slash and what's the name of the file? Pattern underscore 096 GIF. Then I close the quote. So that should give me that should give me um, that image as a background image on my page. So let's save it. Yeah. What about it? No, the, the, the parentheses is around the URL, right. So now let's go and look at this and we'll see how there's a background behind our text. And it actually doesn't look half bad, right? I mean, not bad considering I took only about two minutes to scan through a couple examples and found one it actually looks good. And I can read the text behind it. The text doesn't get in the way. The big problem that you run into with these background patterns is if you pick the wrong combination of, of the, the pattern and the color, we could, you know, we could get a real mess that's hard to read. Let's go and download a, another example uh, and, and try it out just to, to demonstrate that. Let's download this one. All right, let's change it to 093. Well, that's kind of kind of bad. Kind of hard to read. All right. And in fact, uh, depending on the specific picture that you pick, um, if there's enough variance in color, it may hard, be hard no matter what color of font that you use. So what do you do? Well, number one, you don't pick those. All right. Number two is what I could do is I could put this on, on the body and put a different background underneath the paragraphs and so on. So I could do something like this. I forgot the list.
okay? I still don't like it, <laughs> all right? But at the very least, you know, it's, it's legible now, all right? So that's one thing that's often done is you will put a background sort of forming a frame around the whole page, and then you put blocks of stuff that don't have that as a background, they have a plain background underneath it, all right? So that's one thing that we'll, we'll see going forward. Uh, one of our, um, in, a, in a couple weeks probably, maybe in a week and a half or a couple weeks, we'll start talking about controlling the layout of your page more. And when we do that, we'll do a technique similar to this, uh, except it will look a lot better. All right. I'm going to restore this back to the way it was before when I liked the way that it looked. Notice what it did, by the way, is that image is only a t very small image. It's only one square. What it does by default is it tiles it. So it does it just like you're tiling your floor. It makes a pattern simply by the way the image is designed. The image is one square, and the way that it lines up is it lines up to make a nice overall pattern. The nice thing about this is that as I resize it, I can make it bigger, I can make it smaller and the pattern still sort of holds. Now, in some cases, you might have an image that you don't want to repeat. All right? You might have a big, giant background image, you know, and in which case, let's, let's see if we have in our sample images one of them. Yeah, it's kind of small. Um, Flickr is a great source of images. Now, before you say, gee, isn't that illegal to snap stuff from the internet and, and use it on your page? Number one, this is an educational context, so we have a little more flexibility. Number two, there's something called Creative Commons licensing. And what Creative Commons licensing does is when people post their pictures, they give you permission um, to um, use them for non-commercial purposes. So I can go into my search, let's say, and let's say I want to do a search for fall. I can see a bunch of images and I can pick and do an advanced search. And I can say, give me fall, give me pictures, and give me only stuff that is licensed with a Creative Commons license. And with a Creative Commons license, what that says is a creator says, yeah, it's okay to use it if you follow certain conditions. Now, the condition might be that you're not going to use it for uh, a profit-making business. That's what it means where it says use commercially. So if you check that, it will show you the stuff that you're allowed to use even if you're running a business. Also, they might say, yeah, you can use it, but don't alter it. Don't change it. Or they might say you can use it and alter it. The nice thing about a Creative Commons license is that the person that creates it can sort of in advance set some uh, uh, rules about how their, how their work is going to be, uh, going to be used. So let me go do a search. And let's take this one. I'm going to download the size this this image. I'll save it. Let's 
to, I don't know where it saved it to. Oh, it's on my desktop. I'll put it in my images folder. I'll give it a little bit different, better name. I'll change my CSS to use that one. And then we'll view my page. All right. Now, a couple things you might notice about this. Number one is that it, it repeated the image over and over again. That's called tiling. I can go in and I can specify not to repeat it if I want to. All right, and we'll look at that in a second. The other thing is this image is pretty good because most of it is white, but then there are sections of it that are very dark. What do you do if you want to use an image like that? Well, what you can do is... Open it up in an editor. We'll use our old friend Paint. And uh, let's see. That's not it. That's not it. Edit colors. Maybe you can't do it in paint. But what you can do is, let's see if other tools are available. Ah, through, uh, the picture manager. I can go in and I can make it bright. And cut the contrast a little bit. So it almost looks like a watermark. Alright. I can then go and save this. And that looks a lot better, right? You can, you can see the text underneath it. Now, if I didn't want it to repeat, I just have to find the right CSS attribute, which I'm feeling lucky today, so I'm not going to look it up. I think it's simply no repeat. And there we only have one copy of it, if we wanted to do it that way. Now, you know, a lot of this is, is just trying things out and playing with it and seeing what you come up with. All right? um, you don't want to sacrifice readability just to have a cool looking page. All right? So keep in mind that uh, what, what I talked about here, um, you know, experiment with, but by all means don't sacrifice the readability of your page. There's a lot of things you can do to make it uh, work with the background including a lot of the things that I talked about. I'm going to set this one back. I really should, if I was going to use this um, and post it, I would get the uh, creator's name and, and give them credit. I'm going to restore back to this one. Forgot to take out the no repeat. See, with the no repeat, it only shows up once, which doesn't really accomplish the tiling effect that I wanted. But I'll take the no repeat out, and we get this. 
Now, I can put that background image on any tag, right? I put it on the body. I could actually put it not on the body, but on the H1 tag. And that might be a, a effective use of it. So I could say H1, comma, H2, comma, H3. That's simply a shorthand for saying these three tags get this rule. And then the background image is only behind that particular, um, those particular tags. A lot of flexibility, play with it, but again, have fun. One assignment that I used to give my class is I told them to make like the worst web page possible. You know, just have fun changing everything on the page to make it look goofy. Get it out of your system and then make some readable pages. All right, so. Go in and experiment with this to your heart's content, but do be aware when you're ready to turn it in to make sure that it has to work as a page and it has to look good. Did you have a question in the back? I thought I saw your hand. Yeah, just for a moment. I was, I was wondering when you, when you use the image in the body tag, uh -huh. is that a static image or does that scroll with the page? Oh yeah, no, that will scroll with the page unless I use the no repeat option. And the no repeat option then. There's also a position that you can put on it. And, and, and there, there's other attributes too where you could keep it there. Uh, but check out all the positions that you can have for a background image. And it will show you how you could do either one. If you wanted it to scroll, you can make it scroll. If you want it to stay static, it will stay static. So yeah, that's all through the options on, on the image. Yeah. Um, Let's do it. Well, let me just look it up real quick. Yeah. Well, again, you know, um, web development to a large degree is finding out the tags and the attributes, whether they be HTML tags or attributes in CSS. And then CSS has the additional thing of the selector. Let's look. Styling backgrounds. How to set a fixed background. All right. There it has a little smiley face in the background, and as you scroll it, the smiley face stays there. And that's a background attachment is fixed. Is a particular attribute. Yeah. I'd have never guessed that one either, so don't feel bad. All right. Through this discussion, you know, we, we really talked a lot about um, the uh, the use of CSS and the use of HTML and how they each serve their own role. The HTML contains the content of the page. The CSS deals with the appearance. HTML deals with the meaning of the page. Now there's a whole bunch of other tags that we can use to indicate special meaning. There's a, and those are covered in the book. I'll just mention a couple of them real quick. Uh, there's a block quote tag, which you can use if you're quoting something more than just a couple of words. You know, if you're, if you're just quoting a couple of words, then you just do like you would in a paper. You just put it in quotes. But let's say you were quoting, um, you know, four or five sentences. You'd use a block quote tag to indicate that. Now the block quote means that it's a quote. It's a big quote. How you choose to style it is in CSS. So the HTML says what it means that this is a quote. The CSS indicates um, how you're going to make it look. And there's a lot of things that you could do. You could, you could make a little image with giant quote marks to indicate, hey, this is a quote. All right? There's the M tag, which stands for emphasis. And by default, the browser will make that in italics. But you could go and style it some other way. You could, you could go and, and add a different color to it to emphasize it. There's a lot of ways that you can emphasize it. So the EM tag means that this is something you want to emphasize, but the specific style will dictate 
how you're visually going to show that you want to emphasize this, uh, and so on. You can read through those uh, in the book. To the degree that you can keep the content and the appearance of the page separated will give you so much more flexibility going forward. And there's a great website that demonstrates this capability. And I was on it briefly today, and we'll go back to it now. The site is CSS Zen Garden. This page was set up sort of as a proof of concept. Because before CSS was widespread in use, people used a lot of other ways to control the appearance of their page. They used all these goofy HTML attributes and all that, and in a way that resulted in very messy code. What they did here on this site is there's one HTML page, just one. All the pages that we're going to look at on this site are one HTML page, all right? But they've applied different CSS files to it to make it look different. So this is a default page, and let's just notice some of the things that are on this page, all right? The Road to Enlightenment, a demonstration of what can be accomplished. So what is this about? Participation and so on. If we go and click on some of these, notice how this looks. If we click on this one, a walk in a garden, the exact same content, we could match it up if we wanted to. CSS Zen Garden, the road to enlightenment. So what is this about? Participation. All of these are the same HTML page. None of the tags have been changed. The only thing that's changed is a different CSS file is applied to it. And you can see how by doing this, again that's the example I showed before, by doing this you can get really wild different looks. All right? And why would you do that? Well, to be sure, a business isn't necessarily going to want to completely, radically change the way their site looks as dramatically as this, but a business will continually want to change and upgrade their site. They may have a new logo, they may want to go with a different color scheme, maybe seasonally or whatever, and therefore the more flexible you can make your web pages, the better position that you are. And you can do that if you can separate the CSS and HTML. Actually, if we go here, and search. Mine was not accepted as an official design because they only picked the absolute best, but they did include a link to my design that we can view at here. And if we scroll down, Somewhere in here, you'll see a picture of one of my other cats. There's my design for the page. Again, identical HTML as any of the other pages. If you read through the text, the same text, but the, 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 the appearance of it is wildly different. Keep in mind that this is sort of our goal. This is our inspiration to be able to achieve this level of flexibility, you know. Um, but the people that, that created the official designs on this page, you know, they're some of the better graphic designers in the world. So if we don't achieve this level of appearance and flexibility, um, don't feel too bad. But it is sort of a goal to shoot for. And it's, a, it's an indication of what you can do if you use the tools in the way in which they were intended. All right. Next class, we will start talking about design. One of your parts of, of a recent homework was to, was to find some pages that you considered well-designed and poorly designed. And we'll talk about those pages and we'll try to come up with some rules for what constitutes a well-designed page. This will fold into a discussion of your semester project. So 
Before next time, be sure that you familiarize yourself with uh, the, the assignment for the semester project. Um, and because we'll start talking about it next time and we will do continue to do so for the next couple of classes uh, at least. All right, we'll see you over in lab. I will post this example, by the way. <laughs>